I'm Marty Cohn, and this is BCTV's Meet the Candidates 2020, sponsored in part by Brattleboro Savings and Loan. This series affords you the opportunity to hear from folks running for elected office. Today, our guest is Representative Emily Kornheiser, the Democratic Party and Progressive Party candidate for the Vermont House of Representatives Wyndham 2-1 District. Welcome, Representative Kornheiser. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Okay. Well, let's let's delve right into these uh, to these questions. Um, why why are you running again for for this office? Um, first, I'd love to tell folks who might not be familiar with the districts where Wyndham Two One is. Okay. I think that's helpful for people. So Wyndham Two One is what most people think of as West Brattleboro, which is a third of Brattleboro. And that's from exit two on over. And so that includes Mountain Home and includes Westgate, sort of basically until we hit Marlboro or Guilford or Dummerston going in any of those directions. And then there's this funny tiny slice of Canal Street Route 5 from exit one until you hit Guilford. And there's like maybe 15 people who live there. So I don't like to forget about them when I just say West Brattleboro. So those are the folks that I have been representing and that I'm hoping to continue representing um if i'm re-elected this november and why do i want to do that let's see um i first ran because i wanted us to as a community be represented by someone who um, was deeply committed to community voice and to making sure that the very diverse needs of our little community were carried up to the state house um and so having making sure that folks feel like they have a right to speak to the representatives that they feel that the representative is accessible and accountable and communicating with them regularly and really understands um, the range of folks who are working minimum wage jobs and you know struggling really hard to make ends meet and also some folks that we have who you know recently moved here might have transitioned their second home to a primary home and are deeply concerned about climate and sort of all of the all the variations in between i wanted someone who could walk in a i wanted a representative who could walk in a variety of people's shoes and i felt like i was the person for that job i'm Great. running again i didn't answer your question yet right um, <laughs> I'm running again because, partly because to get the work done in the state house, you need to stick around for a little bit. Um, seniority is really important. I think I, my colleagues have considered me a very effective collaborator in this time. I moved from the Commerce Committee and was um, essentially promoted at the end of the biennium onto the Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that um, decides our taxes and revenue. And I think particularly in these very difficult times with COVID, um, where we've really, the cracks in our system have been revealed to more people, I want to be there making sure that we keep our eye on the prize, that we're not talking about just putting the system back together, but really rebuilding our state systems and our tax structure and our economy in a way that works for all of us. All right. So, so what sets you apart from the other candidates running for the seat? Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of experience in government, and so that means that I know how things work. I um, understand leverage points. I can um, span boundaries between conversations and community and communities in order to come to the kind of compromise that's not that halfway point where no one gets their needs met but the kind of compromise where everyone gets their needs met. And I think there's really two important ways that we compromise in the state house. And I, um, because of my experience in government accountability and understanding what our big picture goals are and the small steps that help us get there, I think I'm the best person to find those compromises where as many people as possible get their needs met, starting from the most vulnerable in our community and moving from there. All right, so, so if, if you're reelected, what would be your top two priorities? Two. Um, I think my top two priorities are um, to continue to shift our tax structure to one that's more and more progressive so that people, the people who are um, holding the weight of our state revenues are the ones who are most able to do that. I know a lot of folks in Vermont struggle to pay their bills 
And I think the two best ways we can do something about that are making sure that our taxes are used as progressively as possible to meet the needs of as many people as possible from as few people as possible and to increase wages. And I think when we increase wages for folks across the board, that money is turned back into our communities that we can then use again collectively. Okay. So, so I'd like to turn to, to an issue I, I know you're, you're familiar with, um, but if, if you're reelected, what would you do to ensure that more Vermont families with young children can find and afford childcare? Yes. Um, so I'm quite familiar with this issue, partly because I am a parent of a child um, who was young fairly recently. He's 15 now. Um, and because I've worked for both the Child Development Division and for Building Bright Futures, which is our statewide early childhood coalition. Um, and so if we, in order to meet the needs of parents and young children, and the folks who work in those systems, we need to do three things. We need to increase the supply of the number of people providing childcare. And to do that, we need to make sure they have educational opportunities and that their pay is a living wage. Providing care to young children is difficult, exhausting, important um, work that people need to really be both highly trained and highly supported in. But we can't do that on the backs of parents because none of us can afford it. And so we need to build systems that um, really subsidize the cost of childcare for young children the same way we've done that from kindergarten on through high school. We need to remember that the youngest children in our community are just as deserving of care and support and learning as a five-year-old. Okay, well, now I'm gonna ask you about the other end of the age spectrum. Absolutely. Um, Recent reports indicate that seniors in Vermont face one of the highest rates of financial insecurity in the nation. How do you, how do you think we can make life for seniors more affordable? So there's a few places we can do that. Our healthcare system um, has become increasingly expensive and unstable. And so while we have Medicare as a very important safety net for people with their healthcare expenses. It's not a safety floor. It's not a stable thing to stand on because of all the additional expenses. And so we need to make healthcare costs more transparent for people so that they can make good decisions. But we also need to make sure that supplemental healthcare is really meeting people's needs. So that's one place I think it's really important to do that. The other place that I think we could make life for seniors more affordable is in the arena of housing. And so that's making sure that again, property taxes are progressive. Right now we have um, a few systems in place so that people who make less than $100,000 a year have um, their property taxes lower than people who make more than $100,000 a year, but it's not quite enough yet. And the other thing we can do is really support seniors to be living in the homes that they want to be living in. We have a lot of seniors in our community who are living in four bedroom houses, um, out in the sticks, not because they want to, but because it's very hard to find somewhere else to live. We have very little housing for its, um, the technical term is actually the missing middle. And so we have very little housing for folks who want to live in tighter community, for folks who um, want to live in smaller homes, and for folks who don't need subsidized housing, but don't want to live in a 200 year old farmhouse that would sell for you know, $300,000. And so that middle housing, I think is also a really great option for seniors as they um, look to transitions in their life. Okay, so I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to emerge from, from COVID. Um, and I'm interested in hearing your vision for Vermont in a post COVID world. <sighs> I, um... I share your optimism about half the week. <laughs> and when I think about, um, as I said, sort of the cracks in our system that have been revealed through this time to um, more people, I think about an economy that we have that um, is very dependent on tourism. And that economy that's dependent on tourism is often low wage jobs, they're often, um, difficult schedules for parents to hold. They're often um, 
don't have consistent revenue coming in. We have um, a social safety net that's very frayed. We have, the best we can do is sort of unemployment insurance, which is very difficult for a lot of people to obtain. Um, we have health insurance that's tied to our employers. And um, we don't have family medical leave. And so when I think about sort of the cracks in our system that were most clearly revealed, it's the child care crisis. It's unstable employment for people. And it's the social safety net around family medical leave, around um, stable, stable, affordable, accessible health care. And so when I think about a post-COVID world, um, and the last thing I would actually say is climate change, and I'll explain. That's a little, that feels slightly separate, but I think it's an important point to make. So when I think about a post-COVID world, I think about a world where folks, especially legislators who might be more comfortable in their lives, have really... Um, we have a lot more people who have seen clearly the need for those sources of stability in order to have a community where everyone is getting their needs met and we can all really show up because more people have not had those things through this time. And so we're, there are proposals in the state house for all of those things, for making healthcare more affordable and accessible, for universal healthcare. You know, Vermont's really a leader on that. We passed that legislation a number of years ago um, on fixing the childcare crisis and all of those things. So we have proposals on the table. We almost got family medical leave through this last biennium if it hadn't been vetoed by the governor. And so I, in a post-COVID world, I see us really finally getting our heads around, like this is not just an added perk this is essential to have a thriving community to have these things in place. And then on climate change, I think we've also seen that when we know there's a crisis, we're able to stop and act fast to make changes. And a lot of the challenge around climate change is people said it's too hard for us to change our behaviors. But we've proven that, that it's quite possible to change our behaviors. I don't know if you saw um, right at the beginning of the pandemic when um, Things were really difficult in Italy, but things were sort of just heating up in America. There is um, film footage of the canals in Venice and swans and like all this new greenery and just this incredible time of ecological healing that had happened because the world had paused in just this one little place. And so I think that lesson that it's possible for us to pause and shift our behavior and pay attention to science is a really important one that we've learned through COVID and that we can apply to a lot of other things, especially climate change. Thank you. Good, You're good vision. Good yeah. vision. Thanks. All right. So last question. Okay. Um, last question. This is this is this is the tough one. Oh good. What do you want what do you want voters to know about you? <laughs> I want voters to know that I want to know them. I am so sad that I haven't been able to go knock on doors this year. It was my really just doing that in the last election cycle will always be one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. Um, that experience of both knowing, meeting people at their doorstep and having those intimate conversations, but also knowing the landscape of our community as I walked along it and how sort of households fit together that way. And so, I'm sending out a letter to every constituent. I'm sending postcards to every constituent. I'm hosting um, constituent conversations every Saturday at 10 a.m. But really, if people call, email, however they want to get in touch, you don't need to have like one thing you're angry about to talk to me. We can just talk about who you are, what you want your life to be, and how that might fit into our greater community. And that's really what I want people to know about me now is that I want to hear from you in order to be the best legislator I can be. Representative Emily Kornheiser, the Democratic Party and Progressive Party candidate for the Vermont House of Representatives, Wyndham 2-1. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Right. You can learn more by visiting the campaign's website www.emilykornheiser.org. That's Emily, E-M-I-L-I-E, -E, Kornheiser.org. The, the general election is Tuesday, November 3rd. Remember, you can vote early in person. You can vote absentee by mail or vote absentee hand delivered on election day. Whichever way works for you, please vote. Thanks for watching Meet the Candidates 2020, sponsored in part by Brattleboro Savings and Loan. 
I'm Marty Cohn. Stay healthy. Mm-hmm.